son fishing day, but it doesn't have to be biological father son fishing day. It can be if if you you know if you guys are here, come with us. We're just going to go out to uh, Filer Pond after service next Wednesday. We're going to gather after the service and then head out. And then in a couple weeks, right before school starts, August 12th to 13th. Yule school starts on the 15th. August 12th and 13th, we're going to do a back-to-school camping trip, and we're going to sit around the fire out at Balance Rock and just spend some time together out there, have some worship, um, you know, talk about the Lord and get our perspective straight before school starts. Is there any young people in here that are go to school? No. Yeah. <laughs> They're all out there. <laughs> all right. Well, they'll know for sure. I'll tell them when we get there. Anyways, so if you have any questions, please... Get a hold of me and my wife, and we'll uh, lead you in the right direction, I hope. I hope. All right, let's read, uh, let's read this. Psalm 21. I read this this morning for anybody who was reading the one-year Bible. It says, How the king rejoices in your strength, O Lord. He shouts with joy because you give him victory, for you have given him his heart's desire. You have withheld nothing he requested. You welcome him back with success and prosperity. You place a crown of finest gold on his head. He asked you to preserve his life, and you granted his request. The days of his life stretch on forever. Your victory brings him great honor, and you have clothed him with splendor and majesty. You have endowed him with eternal blessing and given him the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. The unfailing love of the Most High will keep him from stumbling. You will capture all your enemies. Your strong right hand will seize all those who hate you. You will throw them in a flaming furnace when you appear. The Lord will consume them in his anger. Fire will devour them. You will wipe their children from the face of the earth. They will never have descendants. Although they plot against you, their evil schemes will never succeed, for they will turn and run when they see your arrows aimed at them. Rise up, O Lord, in all your power. With music and singing, we celebrate your mighty acts. Amen? I love that. I love when the Bible talks about music and singing, because if we could only see what's actually happened when we worship the Lord, we'd probably be doing a lot more. Let's sing. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He and Together we
again. Together we see. tonight, and we thank you for your presence here with us, God. Just be blessed as we continue to sing to you.
are such a holy God. And Lord, such a fact of your utterly blinding holiness apart from you should create such terror. But God, because of your son, because of the cross, we can stand before your holiness justified by your blood. And God, we don't want to take that for granted. The greatest miracle ever wrought an entire book full of incredible miracles is the fact that you were able to take sinful people and make them holy. And God, I pray that we would continually submit ourselves to that process of making us holy, making us look like you. And that would ultimately be our desire day by day as we face the trials we face, that we would be holy people. And we can only do it by your grace. So I pray tonight as we're studying your word that we would have a deeper sense of the grace that you give us, have a deeper sense of the relationship you have. Lord, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' heavenly name we pray. Amen. got enough leg room? Uh, you're missing a foot rest? Well, there's empty chairs just pulling over. I'll let you. You're welcome to it. Don't be shy. We're going to be in Joel chapter 2 tonight. Uh, welcome to uh, VBS week, Calvary Chapel Buell. So, We've been blessed. Actually, VBS has been really cool. A lot of kids, a lot of fun. And um, maybe one day we'll want to put all the chairs back for, for one night, but not today. It's not that. It was not, I didn't have that much energy when VBS was over today. So, uh, so we're going to be in Joel chapter 2. We're going to continue going through. If you guys remember... The book of Joel is laying out for us the pattern, a prophetic pattern of the day of the Lord. And this pattern is going to come up, we'll see some tonight, because we're going to look a little bit in Revelation, and we're going to look a little bit in some of the things <clears throat> that Jesus had to say. But as we do, we want to recognize that there has been from uh, creation, so you have Adam and Eve in the fall, right? Right? We get to Genesis chapter 7, and we have the flood, a day of the Lord. God's judgment, right? You had a call to repentance. No repentance came. God's judgment fell the, the initial time of the day of the Lord. And those who were, <clears throat> excuse me, placed on the ark were, uh, Noah was perfect in his generations. There were some that Noah's family, there's one family that, that had not succumbed to the wickedness around them. And so the Lord preserved them. And then from Noah, we go to the Tower of Babel. And now, at that point, all men were gathered together in Babel, building a tower to the heavens to declare themselves to be God. And God said, the thoughts of man's hearts are only evil continually. So there was a day of the Lord. He scrambled their languages and... Uh, the different tribes from the different dialects spread around the world. Then the Lord called in chapter 12, Abram, right? And he began working with Israel. Now, the next thing you're going to see is building Israel, the family of, of Abraham, and they find themselves in Egypt. And you have the day of the Lord. God brings judgment against Egypt, delivers Israel and Israel becomes a mighty nation through whom the rest of the world, right, have an opportunity to see the power of God moving in and through them. And it has all this promise. There's all this promise with Israel. But the next day of the Lord is on Israel. Because now all them, that attitude of wickedness is in them, right? It's, it's everywhere. And the whole point of the story is helping us understand the wickedness of man is everywhere. 
There's, there's nowhere we run from it. So the northern kingdom has the day of the Lord. They go into captivity of Syria. The southern kingdom has the day of the Lord. They go into captivity of Babylon. We just did it when we did Jeremiah. Everybody remember? And, and so now we find ourselves in the book of Joel. Joel is laying that pattern out for us so that we can understand, okay, there is a wickedness. It is running rampant. There is the prophetic word of God's judgment is coming and a call to repentance. And if men heed the call and bear acts worthy of repentance, then God responds and, and we move further down the line. But there comes a point where the call to repentance isn't, there's no response, God's judgment comes and the day of the Lord comes. And the promise as we look forward, what is, why does this pattern matter? As we look forward, there will be one more day of the Lord, right? Revelation chapter 19, we've seen it, right? The battle of Armageddon and the Lord returns. And so as he's laying out this pattern next week or the week after, we're going to get into the three poems. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna work uh, Joel chapter 2 to verse 1 to 17. So we're going to look once more at the pattern of the, the Lord's day. And then we're going to look at God's response and then the promise. The promise that the Lord's going to do something new. And so you have the promise of the new covenant. You have the promise of the spirit of God entering to the hearts of men. You have the promise that God will build a holy uh, priestly people to his name. And that will be leading toward that final day of the Lord. So all these patterns are laid out before us. In Joel chapter 2, if you remember Joel chapter 1... We looked at the locusts. Remember all the locusts? Joel chapter 2, it's still the locusts, but now they're arrayed like an army. Let's take a look at it. Joel 2 verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. This is important. It's why when we're challenged to be a student of the word of God, we need to pay attention. We have a tendency to read fast and in a hurry because we are pretty sure we know what everything's all about. Normally, the alarm is sounded from the wall. In this case, the Lord says, sound the alarm from the holy mountain. Sound the alarm from, from the religious center of Israel, from the temple, from the mount, from the place where worship of God was carried out. The trumpet sound, the warning will come from there. And the warning is, let everyone tremble. Why are we trembling? For the day of the Lord is coming. So we've constantly, you guys have, in, in our lives, in my life, there has been a pretty constant message that there's a, a day of judgment coming that the Lord's going to judge the living and the dead. And we need to get our lives right with Christ and be in a right relationship with God so we're prepared for that day. That day of the Lord. And so he says, what is this day? Now here we're not talking about the rapture. We're not talking about deliverance. We're talking about the day of judgment. Look what he says. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains of a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will ever be again after them, all the years and all the generations. So in this part of Joel, he's still referring to locusts. You're going to catch little bits, of little pieces where you go, that kind of sounds like he's talking about the locusts. And we'll, we have reference to Revelation 9 in a little while. But as we look at this, he's saying, no, there's this day. It's the last battle. It's the last battle. Revelation chapter 20 calls it Gog and Magog. Revelation chapter 19 calls it the battle of Armageddon. You have one last battle against wickedness where Jesus Christ is going to return, right? And so he's, he's referring to that. This day is coming, and it's a day of gloom if you're in judgment. He's going to ask in a moment, well, let's look at it. Maybe I don't want to go that far ahead. No, oh, you'll have to wait. I'll tell you when we get there. There's too many things. I'll forget where I was at. So, so right now he's talking about that day of judgment, day of gloom, 
the final judgment against the rebellion. This is the day the language is confused. This is the day of the flood. This is the day of the Assyrian invasion. This is the day of the Babylonian invasion and the end of Israel. This is the day, if we were to move forward, when in AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. So this is, these are the, this is the kind of day he's talking about. It's a day of darkness, a day of gloom, a day of impending judgment. You have multiple, 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 multiple prophets that talked about this day. No shortage. In fact, I could have probably brought 20 more references. You have Isaiah 5 that talks about uh, <clears throat> they will growl over it on the day like the growling of the sea. And if one looks behind, behold, darkness and distress and the light is darkened by the clouds. Jeremiah 13 says, Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble, the twilight of the mountains, when you look for light, but it turns to gloom, and everything is deep darkness. Amos is going to say, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. And a lot of times when we think, so, so for you and I, perhaps, who are looking for the return of Christ to gather up his church and to see the church brought home, that's a celebration. But the day of the Lord, that's Armageddon. Nobody's celebrating Armageddon, right? Have you read the stories of Armageddon? The blood is flowing how deep? Horses bridle for 180 miles? That seems like a bad day. Even, let's just grant that it's hyperbole, it's an exaggeration, it's still a bad day, right? It's a bad day. So Amos is saying, why, why are you looking for that? That's darkness, not light. Uh, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, <laughs> right? So I got away from the lion and I got ate by a bear. That that's, doesn't seem good, right? Or he went into a house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, gloom, no brightness? It's a day of judgment. Now, the point is that day of judgment will come. Yes? The Bible tells us that God will judge the living and the dead. John chapter 5 tells us that all judgment has been committed to the Son, Jesus Christ. So he will judge the living and the dead. The great white throne is Jesus Christ sitting on the throne and all of death and Hades and the dead and are all brought back to life to have their day of judgment before the Lord. That is that that day. If you're waiting to be made right with God on that day, it's too late, right? Zephaniah 1:14 says, "The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast." So th that's Zephaniah. So I got to go back three thousand years to get to Zephaniah. But Zephaniah has this attitude that we have to have our eyes lifted up and live our life expecting the return of Christ, which means tomorrow is too late. We don't put things off. We take care of it today, right? The day of the Lord is hastening. Are we closer to the day of the Lord today than we were yesterday? We are. So there are things, there, are, there is a way that we should respond. Verse 15 of Zephaniah 1 says, A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds, thick darkness. Joel, in Joel 2 verse 3, is going to also use fire to describe it. Now a lot of times today we sing about God sending his fire. And I think when we sing that, we're, we're, we mean the Holy Spirit, right? But in the Bible, fire is more often a, a sign of judgment. That, in fact, the Lord is going to say over and over again that his anger burns like fire. He says in Joel 2, 3, fire devours before them. Behind them, the flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them, desolate Wilderness, And we touched on this last time. It's still the picture. Think about the army, this army that's never been seen the like before. And as this army is coming through and devouring everything in front of it, in front of it, it looks like the Garden of Eden. But when the locusts pass over it, there's nothing left behind it. Like 
a fire going through the, the meadow and the fire burns up everything and what you're left with is scorched earth. So this is the description that he's giving. It's a day of devouring in verse 4. Their appearance, now he's talking about the army, their appearance is like the appearance of horses. Like war horses, they run. Now, if you're a student of the Word of God, there should be an alarm going off in your head right now. Like horses, their appearance is like, I've heard that somewhere before. As with the rumbling of chariots, that sound, can you imagine what it would sound like? A, an enormous horde of locusts coming across the land. They sound like rumbling chariots. They leap on the tops of mountains like the crackling of flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn for battle. Before them, peoples are all in anguish and all their faces grow pale. Now, one of the reasons why God uses, I believe, the illustration of the locusts, something that we can understand. You and I are powerless against a couple million locusts. What are you going to do? A three-inch insect is going to take everything away. If you're powerless against a three-inch insect, how will you be against the Lord of hosts? So he's, he describes this. Look, the faces will grow pale. Everyone will be afraid. And it reminds me of Revelation chapter 9. So let's flip over to Revelation chapter 9, which again is describing for us the day of the Lord, right? We're looking at the day of the Lord, the description of the day of the Lord. We're in the trumpet judgments. And it says, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. Now, oftentimes, I won't go with all the time, but just shy of all the time. Oftentimes, falling stars in the Bible are demons. You remember what Jesus said about Satan? I saw Satan fall from heaven like a star from the heavens, right? I, I saw, so we have this star fallen from heaven to earth, given the key to the shaft of the abuso. The abuso, the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, the air of the sun and the air were darkened in the sm with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts. You see the phrase again, right? So you have this picture again. This is something that we should be familiar with through the book of Revelation. Uh, we Then came from the smoke came locusts on the earth. And they were given power like the scorpions of the earth. So there's something different about these locusts. Yes? They're given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to eat grass. So normally, that's what the locusts do, right? They eat all the grass. These guys are not supposed to eat grass. They just bite people. Now, I just want you to think for a moment. Like, if you go online, go on YouTube and say, show me a, a locust, a swarm of locusts. And it will melt your brain. How many bugs? I, who likes bugs? Because so is, is there anybody here who would just love to be totally covered in grasshoppers? Now, now let's take those grasshoppers and say they don't eat grass anymore. They're like horse flies. And they bite you. That don't sound good, right? So this locust, they're, they're, they will not be able to harm the grass or the earth, a green plant or tree, but only people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were allowed to torment for five months, not to kill. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. This is what judgment looks like. And then he says... Um, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. Does that sound familiar? Like, well, kind of like what Joel, now Joel's talking about a future day of the Lord, and, and Revelation is talking 
Again, about a day using some of the same pictures, right? Locusts like horses prepared for battle on their heads, gold crowns or faces like human faces, hair like women's hair, teeth like lion's teeth. They have breastplates, breastplates of iron, noise of their wings like noise of chariots. With horses rushing in the battle, they have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power is to hurt people. Now here's the point. They have a king. The angel of the Abuso. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In the Greek, he's called the Polyon. Both mean destroyer. The destroyer. So these are military locusts who have a king. And when we think about what Joel's talking about, he's using a lot of similar uh, uh, metaphors, pictures, okay? Now, we can waste our time writing books about how they're Apache helicopters or missiles or any of those things, and, and I think that's a waste of time. The point of the story is that there will be a judgment of God, and it'll be in our minds like locusts. If you see that locust coming, flying over, what, what are your guns going to do? I hear people tell me all the time, oh, yeah, well, I've got, I've got 10,000 rounds of it with AR. Uh, what are you going to do against locusts? If there's 200 million locusts, what are you going to do? You're not going to do nothing. You can't shoot a locust. Well, you can, I suppose. But... The point being, this is, that's not the solution. What is the solution for the judgment of God? Repentance. Right? Their solution, when we read the book of Revelation, there's going to be a theme repeated over and over again. Right? Judgment, past judgment, past judgment. What's he going to say? And still they would not repent. And still they would not repent. And so what was the solution? More bullets? The solution was repentance. That's right. The solution was repentance. And so we see that the, in, back in Joel, Joel 2 verse 6, it says, before them, the people are in anguish. Isn't that what the Lord is describing in Revelation chapter 9? Imagine, I know the people that have the mark of seal of God, they're not being tormented, but everybody else who's being bit by a locust seems like that's a bad deal. Yeah? It's interesting to me because locusts are three inches long, maybe. Well, how big do you think a virus is? And what did that little bitty virus do to the world? So we're not all that big, are we? We're not all that big. We're not all that powerful. We're not all that mighty. And the Lord, the point that the Lord is making is how will you stand against the day of the Lord? Verse 7, he goes on, like warriors, still talking about the locusts, like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. Think like you have a wall or a fence built and, and here come the the grasshoppers are the locusts, and they're coming up right up and over the fence. How tall a wall are you going to build? It won't make any difference, will it? They're going to come up over the wall. Like soldiers, they scale. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. I remember... Listening to the news say, well, if we just take 15 days and stay home. You guys remember? And then, you know, the, the comedy of errors takes place and we go from, from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next. And it's still here today, right? COVID is still with us. And now the funny thing is all, all the shots, I had a shot. Kathy had a shot. I know some people who had the shot and... Uh, you know what? The new strain of COVID doesn't do any good. They just keep marching past all the weapons. Isn't it interesting when you think, just think metaphorically a little bit about how when God's judgment comes, there's not anything you're going to do to stop it. When you're not, you, you can't, 
It, it is coming through. It's just moving through. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb into the houses. They enter through the window like a thief. This is an army. The, what Joel is describing, it's important because one of my favorite verses on earth, and I, I, I don't, except almost every week I have a new favorite verse, but one, one of my all-time favorite verses, it's on Kathy and my rings we got in, in Israel, is going to come up next time we do Joel because I couldn't, I couldn't get there tonight. There's, there's no possible way. But it is when the Lord responds to the repentance of the people and he says, I will give you back the years the locusts ate. I love that, that whole picture. Like we have all this judgment and all these things and oh, and then you call upon the name of the Lord and he responds. And he says, there's so much more that you'll, that you'll receive from a relationship with me. I can even give you back the years the locusts ate. That's incredible promise. An in incredible promise of God that we won't get to tonight. So that's a commercial for <laughs> coming events. We will get there. I promise. Verse 10. So the earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. This should all sound like revelation to you. It should all sound like revelation. And because they're we are describing the same thing, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, and it is a day when, when we see the, the unraveling of, of everything that we think is so vital. Verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before, listen, if you write in your Bible, it's hard to do it in your phone, I know, but if you write in your Bible, listen to this, the Lord utters his voice before his army. That's his army. Now, whether it's locusts or angels or whatever, whatever army God used, he used the Assyrian army. He used the Babylonian army. He used the Roman army. He can use whatever army he wants to. Amen? He's God. He's sovereign. He's in charge. He can do that. But the point is, he's the one bringing them. Remember, one of the biggest struggles, if you've ever read the book of Habakkuk, anybody ever done Habakkuk? If you hang on, we're, we're going to do Habakkuk. One of the things that Habakkuk says, the Lord says through the prophet, if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. Have you ever looked at the things God's doing in your life and said, I, wouldn't, I can't believe this? But he says, I am doing something. And for the believer... Our response is to trust the Lord. We have, there's no fear of the day of the Lord for us. There is trusting the Lord. Trusting the Lord in what he's doing. Listen to what he says. The Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome and who can endure it? Again, you should have bells going off if you've read the book of Revelation. Does that sound familiar? Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. For the great day of their wrath has come, and the question is asked, who can stand? Who will stand before the wrath of the Lamb? So you have this question being asked, who can stand? And what's the answer? Nobody. That's the point. Well, let me clarify. One person, 2,000 years ago, one person bore the wrath of God so that any who would call upon his name could be saved. He bore the wrath of God at the cross. Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, our deliverer, and so when we think about who can stand, no one can stand. How do we stand before the judgment day of God? You stand before the judgment day of God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, bathed in the blood of Jesus. Your sins washed 
white as snow. Amen? Listen to what Jesus said. When we consider this, he begins in, in verse 12, moving forward to say, yet now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me. What's God calling the people to do? Repent. What does it mean to repent? I'm changing my direction, right? I've been in rebellion against God. I've been in rebellion of his word. I've been in rebellion of who he is. And the Lord calls and says, return to me. Turn around. Come to me. What did Jesus say in, in Matthew 11? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Return to me? Is that any different? Come to me. Come to me. In Luke chapter 13, Luke's an interesting book. Luke is a, uh, the gospel um, written by Luke. He's not a Jew. Uh, Luke was a, a, a doctor. And he wrote the gospel of Luke to a person. Right? Usually pastors make terrible jokes about this. He wrote the book to, I'll never forget the guy's name. You guys know his name? Theophilus, because that's the awfulest name I ever heard, right? That's, that's what they always say. Theophilus, which means lover of God. He, he wrote this book to a person in Luke chapter 13. So Luke is like Matthew. We've been studying the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew chose certain events for a purpose, right? He, none of the gospel writers wrote everything Jesus ever did, right? John told us if everything Jesus did had been written down, all the books and all the libraries wouldn't be able to contain it. So they each had a purpose. Luke, in writing this, this is just a, an interesting uh, section in Luke chapter 13 to look at. He said, there were some present at that time who told him about the Galileans. Now, we don't learn much about the Galileans, but here's what we learn. Uh, they told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood... Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So there were Galileans, Galilean Jews who were bringing their sacrifices. Pilate was upset. He decided he was going to wipe them all out. So he mingled by murdering those who brought their offering, the blood of the offering bringer with the offering they brought. So you have the lamb being slain and the guy bringing the lamb. Okay. You guys get what I'm saying? So Pilate is slaughtering. It's a horrible event. And it's got the Jews are upset about it. And they're talking to Jesus. You, you know that the Galileans, Pilate, he, he, he mingled their blood with their sacrifice. I mean, can you imagine something so bad? And in verse 2 of chapter 13, Jesus answered and said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Now, when Jesus is saying this in Luke 13, if you understand that 30 years later, those same people may find themselves surrounded by Romans, facing a day of the Lord judgment, and recognizing the importance of Jesus saying, unless you repent, because if you turn and you follow me and you hear the teachings of Christ, the scripture tells us that when that judgment came on Jerusalem, the Christians left. You know why? Because Jesus told them, when you see the city surrounded with enemies, get out. And so what did they do? They left. They left. And so... He says this, this is, this is just an impactful thing. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. The, what's he saying? The judgment day is coming. Now look at the next phrase, <clears throat> verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse offenders than all others who lived in Jerusalem? No. But I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. It is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. So unless you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, unless you have admitted you're a sinner, turned from your sin and turned to Christ, 
Put your faith and trust in him and confess with your mouth that he is your great God and Savior. Then your, your end will be just like the guys the tower fell on. It will, it will come. There will be a day of judgment for all men. So Joel writes, even now the Lord says, return to me with all your heart. Come to me. Come to me with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Rend your heart. God wants your heart, not your ritual. It's not the ritual of fasting or a ritual of praying or the ritual of tears. We have all, all of us in here have had somebody, maybe one of our children, weeping and crying before us, and we could tell that had nothing to, that did not touch their heart. No? So the Lord is saying, look, I, I want this to be from the heart, right? From the core of our being responding to the Lord. He says, return to the Lord your God. Why? He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love or faithful love. It means he won't give up on you. And he relents over disaster. In Ezekiel, the Lord said, there's no glory in the destruction of the wicked. The glory that God has is when the wicked turns from his wickedness and turns to the Lord. Now the Lord is glorified. Will God judge the wicked and the dead, or the, the living and the dead, the wicked and the righteous? Yes, there'll be, there will be a day of judgment. And unless we're clothed in Christ, we perish. So the Lord is laying out, this day will come, it will happen. But all heaven rejoices when one sinner turns. Isn't that incredible? So why does the Lord lay out for us the concept? Why does he tell us about the day of the Lord? Because we live like none of it matters. We, we get up and we go to the store, we do the things we're doing today like 11% like inflation. What's the big deal? But if you were around in the late 60s and 70s, you might have a different attitude. That's the last time we ignored inflation. And it got worse and worse and empty shelves and closed stores and people that couldn't feed themselves and people having to, to drink hot water, hoping that, the, that there was some sustenance in that. I'm not talking about the Great Depression. So that we live like there's no repercussions to anything we do. So God says it over and over and over. And people go, I don't know. I don't want to read the Old Testament. It's all this judgment. Well, don't forget. The Lord tells us about that so that you will recognize today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to trust in Christ. Amen? Amen. Not tomorrow. Don't wait. Don't put it off. <clears throat> today, <clears throat> excuse me, today is the day. Verse 14, who knows whether or not he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. So God wants to bless and he, wa he, he wants to pour out good things on his children. I want to give my kids good things. And I've shared with you and every single night I would talk to the boys. Hey guys. Let's go to bed tonight without beatings. So all they have to do is go to bed. But there was always monkeying around, and the monkeying around would not stop till dad's belt came off. And then miraculously, it was like, oh, dad, okay, we'll be good. No, it's too late for we'll be good. Now it's time to change behavior. And so this is what the Lord is laying out for us. What are the sacrifices of God? The sacrifices of God in Psalm 51 are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And these God doesn't despise. That the Lord will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing. Not the one that demands to be prospered by God, but the one whose heart is broken before God. Who, like the tax collector, says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Verse 15, he says, 
Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Who is it that he's calling to repent? Just the priests? No, he wants everybody. He wants them all, the people, the priests. Oh, Lord, make not your heritage, uh, or I'm sorry, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room in the brighter chamber. They're saying if there's a wedding feast and the bride and the bridegroom are off in the marriage bed area, tell them, stop. Does that make it urgent? Can you imagine? Hey, stop that. Stop, stop, stop. Come out here. We need to repent. We need to consecrate a fast. We need to open our heart up to the Lord. If there's not a time, if that's not the time it is in the United States, what, what time are we waiting for? How much worse it got to get? Where do the locusts got to be? In verse 17, he says, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage a reproach. By word among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? He's calling them. Call the people to repent. It's so vital. Sound the trumpet. It's so important. Don't eat. It's so important. Stop everything you're doing. No matter what it is. And go after the Lord. And next time, we get to see God's beautiful response. And that is the celebration we want to see from our great God and Savior. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you just for the opportunity that you give us, God, to come to this place. We want to honor you, Lord, in the things that we do and the things that we say. We want to honor you in the promises that you give, Lord, and the hope that you lay out in Scripture. And I know, Lord, that sometimes we're weary of hearing about the judgment of God. I just am reminded how much like my own children I am. That I, I want to I want to respond. I want to stand strong. I want to be an example that God calls me to be. But sometimes it takes me so long to be obedient. And so you tell me over and over and over again throughout the scripture, you call me, you challenge me, you convict me to have a heart right before God. To be in a right relationship with him today. For now is the day. Behold, now is the time to open our heart before a holy God. Lord, we pray that you would guide us and lead us and direct us tonight. That we might glorify you in the lives we live before you. And we will give you all the praise for what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. Man. 
majesty, dominion and authority before all time and here today and forever. Amen. Be glorious. Be up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord lift up his face and give you peace. Lord God, we give you praise in this place for who you are and what you have provided us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>